In 1950, Cascadia was starting to grow to become a major region in America. Since then, it has exploded in population, reaching 11,167,000 residents in 2020. So today we're going to go over how this came to be, talking about the individual cities that make up the Cascadian megalopolis, and then exploring some interesting aspects of the region. Before that, though, I wanted to invite you to join our Discord, which is linked in the description. I talk all the time in there, and we have a nice little community. So if you want to talk to people about geography or talk to me about these videos, please consider joining the Discord, because that's the best way to do it. So let's get started by getting this out of the way before every comment is about it. What is the definition of a megalopolis, and is Cascadia technically considered to be one? Well, it depends who you ask, and there isn't an exact definition. But usually you use the term to describe a group of metropolitan areas, connected to form a continuous populated area. I personally think there are two real megalopolises in the US, the Northeast Megalopolis and the Florida Megalopolis. Both of these are fully connected, and you can go from one end to the other without leaving a city. Now, Cascadia, on the other hand, is not really an actual megalopolis if you're using the tight definition. There are a lot of rural areas between the cities that I'll go over later in this video. Nevertheless, I will be using the term megalopolis to describe Cascadia because it's a long chain of cities that form a populated region, and there isn't a better term to use. So with that, we can start going through the cities and learning about Cascadia and what makes it interesting. Starting with our first city at the southernmost point of the megalopolis, Eugene, Oregon. So Eugene, Oregon is located at the southern end of the Willamette Valley, about 50 miles off the coast. Referred to as the Emerald City, Eugene is a very young and modern town, home to the University of Oregon as well as Bushnell University. This metro is also home to the twin city of Springfield to the east, with its own population of 62,000. The metro area as a whole has a population of 383,000, up from 48,000 in 1950, which comes out at a 698% rise. Next, we move past two towns that are too small to mention, but continue the chain of cities, Albany and Corvallis. Corvallis is a city that has a special place in my heart, as it's home to the Oregon State Beavers, official sports team of the Beaver Geography Channel. Love that place. Uh, but moving on, we go to the capital of Oregon, Salem. Salem is the third biggest city in its state, but the second biggest metropolitan area. It economically largely relies on the state government, which employs 19,000 workers, more than triple that of the second place employer, Salem Health. Salem has had three capital buildings in its history, with both of the former buildings being destroyed in fires, something I thought was interesting. Salem has a population of 400,000, up from 49,000 in 1950. That comes out at a growth rate of 716%. Next up, we have Portland, Oregon, the biggest city in its state. Portland was a very young and exciting city in the early 2000s, with a lot of new people moving there. I do think, though, as the years have went on, Oregon is not rising as fast as it used to. It's a very divisive city. You either love it or you hate it. But no matter what your thoughts on Portland are, you can't deny it's a beautiful area and has beautiful nature and parks. The metro population is 2.5 million, up from 516,000 in 1950, growing at a rate of 387% in that time period. Next, we move across the Columbia River into Washington and work our way up to its state capital, Olympia. Olympia is an underrated area. Being located to the south of Seattle, not many people really think about it when talking about the state. Even though the Super 8 in Lacey is really not great, I still think the metro area is really nice, and I would personally choose it over Seattle. Olympia has the largest growth rate of any city on this list between 1950 and 2020, growing from 18,000 to 298,000 within that time. This ends up at a 1,555% growth rate. Next up, we move to the biggest metropolitan area in this whole region of the continent, Seattle. Seattle is an incredibly influential city in the U.S., home to one of my favorite skylines, with such landmarks as the Space Needle or its waterfront that has went through some changes with the destruction of its viaduct. Seattle is home to major league sports teams like the Mariners and Seahawks, with their stadiums located just south of the downtown also being home to the only floating vehicular bridges in the U.S. The Seattle Metro had a population of 795,000 in 1950, improving to 4 million and 19,000 in 2020, with a growth rate of 405%. Moving to the north, next we have Bellingham, located 21 miles away from the Canadian border. Bellingham is the most northern metro with over 100,000 residents in the country, being incorporated in 1903 from four settlements consolidating. Bellingham is a very nature-oriented city, with easy access to the San Juan Islands and North Cascades. It's also situated at the south end of the Fraser Valley, 
which is also home to Vancouver in the north. Bellingham has a metro population of 227,000 at the 2020 census, up from 34,000 in 1950, with a growth rate of 567%. Finally, moving over the border into Canada, next we have Vancouver, British Columbia. This is the third largest metropolitan area in Canada, and the largest in the western half. There are so many videos on what makes Vancouver unique. It's an incredibly dense, modern, and highly touted city. I personally am not as high on Vancouver, but there's no denying its influence on the megalopolis. Vancouver has a population of 2.6 million as of the 2021 census, up from 556,000 in 1950. That brings us out at a 367% growth rate. Finally, we ended off with Victoria, the capital city of British Columbia, located on the southern tip of Vancouver Island off the Pacific coast. The island is not connected by road, making it feel more cut off from the country. Victoria is a very attractive city, being a major tourist destination, as well as having a rising technology sector. Victoria has a population of 397,000, up from 105,000 in 1950, which ends at a 278% growth rate. So those are all the cities I wanted to go through today. Next, I wanted to go over the more empty areas of Cascadia that take away the official megalopolis term. When traveling between Eugene and Albany, this is our first, obviously, rural area. You can't tell me this looks anything like a megalopolis, with lots of farmland and no towns with over 10,000 residents located there. Moving farther north, we have the mountainous region between Longview, Washington, and Olympia. This is definitely different because there are still populated areas and small towns that kind of connect them up. But with the terrain not being very friendly to cities, the area still feels rural at times. You could try and connect it from Longview through Castle Rock, up to Vader, Winlock, and up into Centralia. So there's definitely an argument to be made for this region to be connected, but I wouldn't put it there just yet. Finally, the area in between Bellingham and the Canadian border still has a little work to do before I can really call it connected. The valley here just doesn't have much going on, and you can see a pretty clear rural feel until you get to Blaine and the White Rock. Before we end, I wanted to go over the nature aspect of Cascadia. Throughout the whole chain of cities, there's one theme you see everywhere, and that's the outdoors and parks. All of these cities are built in valleys at the foots of mountains, and you even see them starting to build into the mountains. That's what makes this region so interesting, with the Cascades really affecting everything. Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Olympic, and the North Cascades are just a few of the major mountains and parks located in this region. There's so much going on, and I do genuinely think there's no prettier region in the U.S. than Cascadia. My favorite trip in my whole lifetime was when my family visited the Pacific Northwest region of the U.S. Seattle was so interesting, Olympic was absolutely stunning and so unique, and there was simply too much going on to explore at all. I highly recommend this region as a trip for anyone who hasn't been there yet. All of this makes Cascadia one of my favorite regions of the country and continent. There's so much going on, and I think it's highly underrated. Thanks for watching. Thank you to the members this week, Pol Potts, Pie Hole, Blang, Christopher DeAngelis, JL, United States Railroad Crossing, Don DeShirlia, Dark Bird, Obigrad, Elijah Pass, Big Pass D, Jeremy Crone, Wolfling73, Snyder Schwein, Florida Jake, Somnam Woods, Stormy Knight, Nikita Martinoff, Haystack, Benjamin Whiting, Ryan Devins, Hase of the Wolf, Jake Holloway, Dominic Psyche, Rosewood4, and Bryzen. I appreciate you all so much, you genuinely help out the channel a ton. If you want to become a channel member, the link is down in the description below. You're just helping me out a little bit extra because you appreciate the content. It's not required, it's just really appreciated if you want to go an extra step to help me out. Thank you so much.